live from Austin, Texas. It's the Cube, covering Dell EMC World 2016. Brought to you by Dell EMC. Now here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to Austin, Texas, everybody. This is Dell World 2016, Dell, Dell EMC World 2016. It's only the third time I've done that this week, Stu. <laughs> uh, and this is theCUBE, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. The other Michael is here, Michael Cote, who's the director of technical marketing at Pivotal Software. Good to see you again, Michael. Yeah, you guys too. I was just saying, I think last time we talked, we were back in the corner of this same room. Yeah, so and, and, yeah. and <laughs> you, right. you, you're, you were Dell then, yeah. you're Pivotal now, sure. and Pivotal's now part of the family. So it, right. it's almost like a homecoming for you, right? And we're in your, your home neighborhood. Yeah, so. it's great. I'll have a lot of office space that I can lord over my colleagues <laughs> here in Austin since they're headquartered. It'll be wonderful. So what's new with you these days? What are you working on? What's exciting you? So nowadays, I work on what we call the advocate team, which the rest of the world will know that as evangelism, but we like to call ourselves advocates. So most of the people on my team, they actually like can do real work, but I just know how to make PowerPoint slides. So other people on the team, they talk about programming and sysadmining and all the stuff that you, you know, would need to worry about with Pivotal Cloud Foundry and, and work on. But I mostly go and talk with, uh, I would say management and enterprise architects and above about, uh, you know, maybe if you guys have a better phrase about digital transformation and how they change the way they think and organize their companies and operate so that they can, you know, do their digital transforming and all of that. Um, I'm so not sure we have a better term. I mean, everybody talks about it. Yeah. And, you know, I guess it means different things to be different people, but everybody, the themes are everybody's afraid of getting disrupted. Michael Dell talked about that, that, sure. that today, okay, of course. Digital means data. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, really, if it's digital, it's, it's data. Data's growing at a ridiculous rate. Uh, so it's all about, all right, well how do I transform and how do I support making money with data? Yeah, yeah. As opposed to monetizing the data, which everybody sort of mistakenly got wrong. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah, days. yeah, well I think that was back in the era where like Facebook was IPOing and people were like, why is this worth so much? They've got all this data, it must be the data that fits into a spreadsheet and then you can start doing all <laughs> sorts of ratios and then you get obsessed with the data. And I remember, uh, you know, there used to be the digital, what was it, the number of storage in, in the world, and it was just like ballooning all the time. So yeah, it was like a fast moving big elephant thing, which I'm sure it still is, just like, you know, Lemonade's still popular. But now, I, th I think what, what I see a lot of large organizations figuring out is, I mean, I think it's good to think, if you're defining digital transformation, it's good to ask what analog transformation is, <laughs> right? And, and like, essentially, when you kind of run through the imagination of that trap, it's, it sounds really hokey, but it's basically like, what if we were just much better at doing software, and we had software for all parts of our business, and we could release it like once a week, and our software was as good as like Facebook's and Google and Apple, and people interacted through software, internally and externally. And I mean, I think it, to us in the tech world here up on a stage, like that sounds sort of like, I'm even kind of motioning how absurd it is, but for most people, like, that's not the way businesses run. Like, there's not a software first approach to solving business problems. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a lot of good points there, but I think one of the opportunities we have is, you know, while everybody's not a Facebook or an Apple, you know, you're wearing a smartwatch. You right, know, you're right. carrying around a smartphone, and every company needs to be able to reach you there, and the tools, and you know, the things that are available, I can get down to a smaller company and reach people sure. using you know, my big data, cloud, you know, all right. of those, those type of things. I don't have to be a you know, 100,000 person company to be able to create something that can reach you know, either the B2B or the B2C uh, you know, where they are. Right, and I mean, I think that's one of the major drivers is, as you were talking about, the, the fear of disruption, right, which is always, at this point, people like to say, oh, that's the wrong definition of it, but it's just like words change definition. It's the fear of a little company taking over a big company's turf. And, and I think that's one of the major drivers, as you were saying, is genuinely, uh, like new technological advances, uh, like make it possible, it basically removes this asymmetric advantage that larger companies used to have. And now the playing field's much more leveled, right? And, Granted, you know, these small companies that get an advantage through using uh, you know, your mobile phone and software, they grow big, but they can basically compete with more or less anyone they want. They can, they can more compete on the quality of the product versus on a traditional sense of competitive advantage of like high barriers to entry and things like that. Like, there's probably still not going to be a lot of upstart telco companies, right? But that's, that kind of gets to the point of like, that's an analog industry, a three-dimensional world where you're like actual laying cable and managing it. But if the business that you do is all digital, right, there's no physical manifestation of it, 
then it's a lot easier, to, like it doesn't matter what size you are. As long as you've got a good idea and execution, you can be on a level playing field with everyone. But, but even uh, telco companies, look at WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, hit Bitcoin, everybody's talking about block, everybody's going blockchain yeah. crazy over this open, open source you, you know, tool that was developed. Sure, sure, the, yeah, I, I mean maybe, maybe that's a bad, it's, it's sort of like you know, uh, bulldozers. <laughs> right, like that, there's a lot of like capital investment it takes to make bulldozers. Yeah, Negroponte. And, and, and even, even, you know, there's always a slide in these presentations that will have like Uber, uh, Airbnb. Airbnb, and Ooh. Tesla. Yep. And then Tesla is like, well that's really expensive, right? Like that took a lot of money and they've got a factory. So like, the closer you get to three dimensionality, like the, I think the harder it is to be disruptive up and down the stack, to your point, you know, whether it's like WhatsApp or car companies who are doing software on, on the upper ends, like there can be interesting disruption there, but like you still need the robots to build the things, which is oh. a little pricey. It, but anyways, it's yeah, I, I, you know, I think of the, you know the the Amazon line is you know your margin is our opportunity. So you right. know hey, we used to say you know for for a while it was like whoever thought that you could make a lot of money on coffee or like <laughs> water is like you right, know two yeah. areas that totally got transformed uh, there, but not in the software space, but. You know, let, let, let's switch to, I mean, you, you focus a lot on kind of agile development, you know, the DevOps sure. space. You know, what do you see happening organizationally inside companies that allow them to move fast? I mean, I, I, I was listening to a podcast recently where it was like, even inside like Docker, they have a hard time keeping up with their release trains. And you know, you, you take the average IT person, there's so much getting thrown at them constantly. Sure. You know, how, how do we help organizations? Yeah, I mean, I think organizationally, uh, there's, uh, Someone was reminding me that you should never list out three things you're going to say earlier today. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. But I mean, there's sort of three three things that fit into what you're saying. One is the worst, which is do nothing, right? And so a lot of companies have organized themselves into, I guess, a, a functional organization, right? Like here's the server people, the whatever, like different silos we would say. And many companies, they, I don't know if want is the right word, but they end up staying that way, to put it in the passive voice. And that's really where things don't go well because you can't move very fast and it just like, it doesn't work well. If, if your intention is to be constantly innovating, right? To be digital, as it were. Uh, and the second one is there are companies who, um, and this is what we saw for many years before this, they basically go to SaaS companies. They just circumvent this whole thing. And we used to call it shadow IT or rogue IT, which I would always misspell as rogue IT, which is funny. But <laughs> like, uh, you know, they basically circumvent centralized silo control to get the, the software that they need. So that's one way of doing it. But the companies that we work in who actually want to change the companies, what they end up having to do, and I see them struggling mightily with doing, is they have to take their organization and collapse it down into product teams, right? So on, and this is what you hear about in DevOps and everything. So on one product team, you'll have developers, a product person, the whatever operational role you need. You might even have testers and security people on that one unified team dedicated to that one product. Now, that sounds like crazy town to people who have been like optimizing how IT runs, but it turns out if you're deploying software every week, if not every day, like those people do have to be dedicated to that thing. And then you also end up seeing the results that if you actually are dedicating people to this one task and they're fully plugged into how people are using it and they're improving the software, it's actually worth it to go through what seems like an unoptimization of unsiloing them to do that. But again, it's really hard. Like often like HR has to get involved in facilities, like all these things that you would have no it, idea it is about hard. getting involved. Writing great software is hard. I mean, yeah. Benioff I think was the first to make the quote, there'll be many more SaaS companies coming out of non-tech companies than, than tech companies. Right. Okay, well a lot of non-tech -tech companies, even tech companies have struggled to build good software. As you say, you got to find the people, you got to figure out how to organize it. Uh, you got to have the right technical chops. Sure. You got to make some bets. So, first of all, do you buy that premise that companies are becoming SaaS companies? And yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you know, I think about that a lot. I used to work on cloud strategy last time we talked, and and SaaS is a, has become. It used to be the most definitive thing of what cloud was. Yeah. And now, I mean, you're making me think. It is a little squiggly now, right? Like, like for example, when we go to our bank and we use online bill pay, are they a SaaS company? <laughs> right, well, like, like it's so certainly it, software. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's I software. They, they've gone through digital transformation. Right. Yeah, it's like <laughs> software delivered over the internet. Yeah. Right, <laughs> which I think is kind of what SaaS. I mean, you could quibble about ASPs versus SaaS, but like, it is sort of like to an end user perspective, it looks the same. So yeah, I mean, I think I think that is kind of 
a lot of the people we work with, especially, they move towards wanting to provide their business software as a service and their customers and things like that. And then, but then it does get to the point you're saying is like, now you're a software company, right? Which is, there's a reason software companies are so highly valued because it's like hard work, right? Cool. It's not or, easy to do. Hey, we need, a, we need a mobile app. Okay, great, hey, yeah. here's a mobile app. And then they outsource that and then, then what? Exactly. <laughs> and yeah. you, you see that a lot, right? So. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's, that's, that's even one anti-pattern that I see a lot is, um, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, outsourcing, right? And, and I often liken it to like kids. Like, I, I often think it would be great to have a nanny, right? Like to take care of my kids and everything so I could hang out. But then I think like I wouldn't really be doing my kids, and the analogy here is to your software. Like I should yeah. probably be present all throughout their life, like good or bad and I'll kind of lose track of what's going on if I'm not involved in it, if I've outsourced that. And I think, similarly, you see that with, I mean, we can all identify software who's in the tech industry and you're like, yep, they, uh, they outsource that, right? Like, it's not evolving, it's not continuing. So you really have to, if you want software to be core to part of your business, then you have to treat it like that, which is, Difficult and expensive, and, and it takes a lot of attention. But and so you don't coming back to the digital part. transformation discussion that we're having, a lot of times customers you know, feel like they need it. We talked about the paranoia factor, but there's not necessarily an ROI there, or at least a clear path right, to right. a business justification. How do they fund it? You know, it's a lot of trial and error. Sure, a lot of mistakes are being made. Probably more mistakes, more more failures than successes, which maybe isn't necessarily such a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's not always a lucrative. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean there, there's, there's a, uh, uh, as they say, boy, you, you said a mouthful there, right? Like, I, th I, think, I think there's two things. One, um, there's this orientation that we in the software business have, and it, it used, like, it sounds absurd, but it's sort of like you embrace failure, right? Like, let's make bi bigger mistakes tomorrow. And, and the way to think about that is that, uh, you know, hopefully we're, us three still learn things. But if you think about it, when you're learning stuff, it's basically constant failure. Like you're learning by failing at something until you get it right. And so, once you reorient yourself that, obviously catastrophic failure of like the whole business goes under, is that's not a good lesson to learn. <laughs> but, uh, like you, you learn by failing, right? And so, so as one example, uh, there, there's a good example that everyone loves the IRS. They, they, they were following this process where they thought we should present how much money people owe who are delinquent and we'll give them all of their financial history, right? Because we're accountants and that sounds awesome. So they tested this out and they failed to have people figure out how much money they owe because it's confusing. You're like, I just want to know how much money I owed. But because they were sort of embracing this failure way of doing it, they actually got that feedback and very quickly deployed a new way of doing it that just showed you how much money you owe. And all of that sounds obvious and easy, but unless they kind of had this idea of failure being okay, they wouldn't have discovered that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that's, that's really how the sort of learning process goes in and, and the lesson that you take from a software company is, obviously burning down the building's not good, but failure is how you get new data and you learn new things. Okay, got a question for you about Cloud Foundry. Uh -huh. uh, just to get back, back, back to some of the pivotal stuff. When I think back to when Cloud Foundry was inside of VMware, the discussion was when we were figuring out what this whole pass thing was and everything, it was like, okay, in my data center, I virtualize, when I go to the cloud, you know, I want microservices, I want like a lighter layer, and therefore like Cloud Foundry, that was going to be how VMware extended there. Right. Last week, VMware announced that they're going to take bare metal servers and you know, run VMware in the cloud. And I sat back and I'm like, I, I don't understand. This is why, you know, this is why we have PaaS, this is why we're doing it. So I, I'm curious from the pivotal side, uh, you, you have some thoughts as to kind sure. of architectures, microservices, where, yeah, where things I mean, fit. I, so, so from a pivotal perspective, so I, I have a, at least for me, delightful thing. Like I used to cover them when I was an analyst yeah. and now, now I work there. Um, and what's interesting is you, if you look at the way that our customers use Pivotal Cloud Foundry, um, they basically like, they think of, and, and this used to be a bad way of putting it, but they think of the cloud as just like the place I run stuff, yep. right? And for various reasons, sometimes they want to run it in their own data center, sometimes they want to run it like in a proper cloud, sometimes they want to colo it and whatever, and really all they want is like, we'll call it like multi-cloud or portability, but they really want, they want that layer that we just write our applications to. And so, I think, I think what we on the vendor side have learned, and you even see this from you know, AWS and other people, is that you can't be too orthodox about which side of the firewall you run things on, right? Like once, once the hordes of actual users come in, 
they just want to run their stuff. And they'll have various different places to run it. Like we, we announced this, uh, I think it was today, that you can, you can run Pivotal Cloud Foundry on Google Cloud, right? And um, Home Depot, they, they're, they run stuff, they're looking to run it on, on Google Cloud and they're a customer of both of ours. And, you know, I mean, they have a logical reason, right? Like they don't want to run on Amazon. You can sort of do the math on that one. Uh, but, you know, whether they're running on private clouds or Google or AWS or Azure, like from our perspective and from a lot of the way our customers use it, like they don't really care about that so much. I mean, they care about it, but in aggregate it doesn't matter. Like they're more focused on the parts you're raising up, like, uh, what I'm focused on is writing the right microservices right. so that I can more rapidly put out new applications and new thing, do things, right? Like, I mean, my joke is always, you sit down, the CIO sits down with the CEO for the annual review, and I don't think any CEO has ever said, good job provisioning servers, right? <laughs> like, yeah. you were, that was awesome. Exactly. Right, like instead. Double that next yeah. year. <laughs> instead, they get rewarded for like, good job enabling the business and providing the services that our business needed to make money and all of that stuff. And so, you know, the more, the more you focus, exclusively down the stack, like you, you kind of cut off uh, All right. so, flexibility. So I, I guess if I summarize and maybe comment on this, the VMware on Amazon, it solves flexibility on the data center, but does not address any change in application, which is what Pivotal's usually doing. Any, any, any change in application? Oh, so, right, right. you know, t t changing from kind of my traditional, you know, application that I have, you know, virtualized application I'm running versus a more oh, microservices right, yeah. architecture. Yeah, I mean, it, dep it depends what you're running in there, right? Yeah. Like, like from our, from a Pivotal perspective, uh, I forget the percentages, they're probably not public anyways, but a, a large percentage runs Pivotal Cloud Foundry on VMware. Yeah. And then they also run it on OpenStack and things like that, and so, in that sense, um, you know, portability is always a little funny because there's various things you depend on that are hidden by networks and stuff like that. But, but yeah, I mean, the idea that we've always had is as you go up the stack, let's see if I can do this in, in the air. If you're an application at the top of the stack, you should be able to be pretty ignorant about everything below you, right? Like you shouldn't really have to know about it and specialize it. So in that sense, you know, whether you're running your, your container, your, VM, your VMware uh, thing over an AWS or on a private cloud or wherever else, like, the stacks above it don't really care. Now I'm sure the people at those levels really care about it, but you know, that's great for well, them. Well they care if it doesn't work, they care if it doesn't perform. Sure, sure. Right, they care if it doesn't give them the quality right. of service. Yeah. Otherwise they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to hear yeah, about no, it. Yeah, no, and that goes back to that annual performance review thing, right? I mean another, it's, it's fun to like be all hand wavy about culture and all this stuff, but I always like to return to what enables all this is exactly your point, is that there are genuine cloud technologies, namely a lot of automation, and doing, doing a lot of compute and automation very cheaply that enables people to be not caring about those lower layers, right? Like, I'm sure there were CIOs who got rewarded for provisioning, right? Back when it was expensive and costly and, and a critical part of it. But nowadays, like, it's not really, like, it's, it, it should be not a big concern that you have if you're doing modern day type of application development about it being configured and worrying about it. So, yeah, I mean, that's, to me, that's a lot of what ultimately cloud has enabled is that no, now we can focus on developing good software instead of focusing on like networking config and all this like server stuff at the bottom. We don't have to read man pages as much as we used to. So bring it back to Pivotal. What's, so what's happening these days? You, got, you still got the tip of the spear, which is the, the Pivotal data you know, services. All right, how do, what do you guys call it? Uh, so, Pivot, so, Pivotal yeah. Lab. Yeah, yeah, uh, we, so we, we, have, we have basically labs, data, and platform. There you go, labs, data, and then cloud platform, right? right. So talk about that sort of structure, what's happening, how's sure. the business going? Yeah, yeah, so I mean generally the types of engagements I've seen us getting into is uh, large organizations come to us, and, and I say organizations specifically because it's, I don't know what, if, if you say government is the opposite of that for-profit, you got your for-profit and your non-profit. Organizations works. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and anyways, I mean, like we were talking about earlier, I mean, I, I was going over that IRS example. Um, you know, there's also, every large organization, uh, they have custom-written software that they want to do better at. And so they, they come to us and they look for Pivotal Cloud Foundry as that platform that removes all that automation stuff they need to worry about. And then the labs part, so labs is actually, I think it's maybe like six or 800 people now, and they actually work with you, paired up with you, literally pair programming and doing other things. And essentially, they don't only train you and coach you, but they do the actual work of, of uh, the new applications that you're working on, things like that, so they train you up by doing actual work. And eventually they leave, you know, you can do the viral spread of that. Like, when, as you do rotating pairs, you spread that knowledge. And then the data part often, the, you know, I, I was actually talking with someone yesterday, 
where if you think about a bunch of IoT cases, right, the data part is really good because there's this loop of I collect a bunch of data, I ingest it, I need to analyze it, and then I need to quickly react and figure out what to do next, right? And having like the in-memory grids that we have and also the big data things that we have, you gotta, that data has to be somewhere, right? And then you also need the application layer to like actually, like you were just showing me some dashboards, like, that's not free, right? Like you have to have applications written yeah, around yeah. it that, that express all that data. And so those three things together really work well. So you've got labs helping you out with the process. Like once you've got your fingers on the keyboard, what keys do you press and how do you do it and how do you whiteboard things out? And then you have Pivotal Cloud Foundry that runs it all and removes that need to be rewarded for provisioning servers. And then the data part is sort of like, it's not all of it, but it's a fair amount of the blood that runs through the systems that helps you decide what to do next and how to, how to run things and, and ongoing in your business. Cool. Well, Michael, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Sure. It's good to see you again, appreciate yeah. it. Sorry I didn't get a sports jacket. I'm oh, a little no, underdressed. We, we appreciate that. Yeah, you got it's the developer uh, look. You'd really look like a fish <laughs> out of water if you did that. <laughs> All right, well thanks for having me, it was yeah, fun. Our pleasure. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest right after this short break.